Hello, Refuge family. I hope you guys are doing well, staying safe, staying healthy. I um, just want to say I miss you guys so much. I miss uh, the Refuge youth. Uh, we've been having some fun on Thursday nights, having our, uh, our youth meetings on Zoom and so on. But uh, I cannot wait for us to all be back together. But for the time being, uh, I'm so excited that we have the opportunity to worship in our homes um, as a church body. And I'm so thankful that uh, we have each other in this time, even though we may not all be together. And I know when we are together, we're going to worship like never before. We're going to have the most powerful church services we've ever had at The Refuge. I love you guys. I miss you guys. God bless. Hey, Refuge Church family. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us again tonight for our Thursday night service. Uh, I will give you fair warning right now at the very beginning of this video that uh, there will be a special announcement later that you will not want to miss um, at some point in this video. I can't tell you exactly when, uh, but there will be a very special announcement that you really shouldn't miss. I do want you to know that we are staying current with the news and keeping in touch uh, with the pastor of the Nazarene Church on what things will look like or look like uh, for us to begin using their property again and as things uh, hopefully will begin to reopen soon. I am very aware of our Illinois governor's shelter-in-place order that's been extended until May 30th. Uh, but even that, it seems like there might be some changes that we could see in the near future. But for the time being, you can expect us to continue to hold services the way we have over the past uh, month and a half uh, by way of video on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and on Thursday evenings at 7, uh, although we are looking for new and creative ways to come to you and your homes and for us to worship together and hear the word together. Uh, my heart is heavy to share some news with you about the passing of Janet Golden. Uh, maybe you recognize or maybe not recognize this name. This is uh, a lady, a precious lady that uh, in times past, she has been a faithful member of the Refuge Church, attending services regularly. She has been a resident uh, for some time now at a nursing home here in Rock Island. And we got news just, I believe it was yesterday, I spoke with Brother Sylvester Parker, who shared the news with me, and also with Janet Golden's daughter, Sakina Cunningham, about Janet Golden's passing. Uh, this is a dear lady, like I said, that we have been privileged to witness, be filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in the name of Jesus. And she had many underlying health conditions, but because she recently came down with the COVID-19 virus, uh, it did complicate her health to the degree that it ended with her past. And we want to pray for Sakina Cunningham, as well as for the family of Janet Golden and all those that grieve her passing. We want to pray for them. Also, this coming Sunday, as we have announced previously, uh, back in, I believe it was February and March, we were giving a faith forward report and talked about the exciting news of how close we are to our goal that we set a year ago of $315,365. We are so very close. And we had previously announced that our giving toward this specific campaign that will be counted towards the Faith Forward campaign, uh, that we will receive a final sacrificial offering, I believe that we said on the first Sunday of May. It was either the first or second Sunday. My memory is failing me a little bit, but uh, we do plan to extend that through the month of May. And our hopes is that we will be able to celebrate together, not just by way of video, but in person, we'll be able to get together, celebrate together what uh, God has allowed this church to be able to give towards the future and towards the kingdom of God, our future facilities. Uh, but this Sunday, uh, I have asked Brother Christopher Walker to preach, and so he will be sharing what the Lord has laid on his heart, and he has already discussed the matter with me at great length, and I'm very excited about the message that he has on his heart to share with the Refuge Church that I believe will also coincide 
uh, with this matter of our Faith Forward campaign. And so let's be looking forward to that. I will invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Again, as you've heard me say in previous videos, if you do not already have your Bible and you own a Bible, uh, whether uh, in print or on app, I would encourage you to turn there together with us. Again, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll be reading verse 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul here is writing to the church, the Christians, the new, uh, the born-again believers in the city of Corinth, and he writes to them in verse 12, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. I'm going to ask you to join with me. This time, would you bow your heads? Let's pray together. Let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts tonight. And uh, let's also remember the family of Janet Golden as we pray that the Lord would comfort and strengthen them. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you so much for this evening where we're able to gather together in our homes for the purpose of worship and hearing your word. Help me, Lord, to speak your word as your spirit leads me to provide for the flock of God, which you have purchased with your own blood, the word that you have for this night for our hearts. I believe that you're able able to take this message that is heard by all and allow it to be communicated in such a certain and a specific way that it ministers differently to each person in a unique way that fits their individual circumstances. Lord, we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we clap our hands to the Lord and give him praise. Lord, we love you. We honor you and worship you, Jesus. We invite you to come and speak to our hearts right now. Speak to our hearts. Minister to our lives in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Uh, if you're standing for the reading of the word, you may be seated. Amen. Um, now, to understand Scripture, it is often helpful to learn how to use Scripture to translate or understand Scripture. What I mean by that is every once in a while you may happen upon a passage of Scripture where uh, there is a word that is being used that is uncertain or unfamiliar to you, and it's uh, wise to, to develop a, uh, a practice of using the Scriptures and the entirety of Scriptures to understand verses and certain portions of the Bible. Uh, instead of just quickly running to anyone's commentary or even anyone's opinion, which commentary is just that. Uh, for example, the word that's found in our text tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there is a word there that uh, maybe not many of you are familiar with or use very often, if at all, and that word is expedient expedient. So we would look at this word and uh, open up a, a concordance or a word search on a Bible software program and look for the word expedient and other places that it's found in scripture and then find how it's used and maybe better develop an understanding of what that word means in context. So we look at the word expedient, and I would direct your attention to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. And I know this is a lengthy portion of scripture, but bear with me. And if you have your Bible still available, go ahead and turn there. John chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. We find the Bible records that the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together a council. And said, what 
do we? For this man doeth miracles. They're speaking about Jesus and how his popularity is rising, uh, especially by the miracles that he's doing. And they're talking among themselves. They already have um, an unfavorable view of Jesus. And they're asking themselves, what do we do about this man, Jesus? What do we do? He's doing these miracles. Everyone is following after him. Verse 48 says, if we let him alone, if, if we don't do anything about him, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Now, let me pause here just to say this, that we find one of the, the very uh, sources of their jealousy of Jesus. These chief priests and Pharisees, uh, they don't want Jesus to rise to this elevated position of popularity with the people, primarily because they know that this will garner the Romans' attention and the Romans will come down hard on all the Jewish people. And essentially, these religious leaders were afraid that the Romans would take away their place or position and their nation, that they would come down hard on the Jewish people. Verse 49, again, this is where it gets very, very interesting. The Bible says that one of them among these leaders named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Ye know nothing at all. He says, you guys don't know anything. Verse 50, nor consider that it is expedient. There is that word. Nor that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this, and this the Bible says, spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put Jesus to death. Now, let me give you a little explanation of these few verses. Here is Caiaphas among his peers and comrades that were leaders of the Jewish people there in Jerusalem, and they were coming together and trying to figure out what they're going to do about this Jesus. And they're talking, well, if we just leave him alone, the Romans are going to come down on us. And then Caiaphas says, listen, you guys don't know anything. He says, it is, it is necessary or it is expedient or it would be advantageous that this one person, Jesus, die so that the nation would be preserved. The only way that we're going to preserve our nation, Israel, the Jews, is if we kill this Jesus. And here's where it gets really interesting is that the writer of the gospel says and acknowledges that Caiaphas, because of his position as high priest, he actually, unbeknownst to himself, he prophesied that Jesus would die so that others will live. What a powerful thought. Jesus would die so that others would li live. Now, so again, we see the word expedient used here. Also in John 16, we find that Jesus is in the middle of a long discourse. He's teaching his disciples. His time is coming to a close. And Jesus is warning his disciples that they're going to experience suffering. They'll live and die for his namesake. And uh, that they won't be left alone during the middle of these things. He understands that his words are causing the listeners, the disciples, to be filled with sorrow, especially when Jesus tells his disciples that he's got to leave them. He's going to have to go away. And so Jesus says this to his disciples in John 16, verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. There's that word again. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Again, we're digging deeper as to the meaning of this word by allowing scripture to interpret scripture. And the word expedient, we find that he is communicating to his disciples, it's, it's needful or it's beneficial, it's advantageous, it's profitable for you for me to leave you in person or in body so that I could send to you the comforter. 
Because if I don't go away, Jesus says, I the comforter won't come. Um, let's look, also look at, uh, at that, that scripture that we started with tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All things, Paul says, are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What he is saying here, the Apostle Paul says, I can do anything I want to if Christ has not said no. If, if the Lord hasn't said, thou shalt not do it, I could do it. But he goes on, he says, but some of these things, they're not good for me. Even if I'm allowed to do them, the Living Bible paraphrased this verse and says, even if I'm allowed to do them, I'll refuse to if I think that they might get such a grip on me that I cannot easily stop them if I want to. He says, I'm not going to bring myself or allow myself to be brought under the power of anything. Even if it's something that's not necessarily sinful, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily beneficial. Please stay with me tonight. I, I, my, my heart is heavy with a message to communicate to my church family. Paul is saying there are some things I could do that I choose not to do. There was some confusion among the Corinthian Christians Later on in the same book, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there was some confusion among the Corinthian Christians about whether they could eat meat from an animal that was sacrificed by pagan people to false gods or false idols. That meat that would be sacrificed or that animal that would be sacrificed to false gods would then be taken and sold in the market at kind of a discounted, uh, discounted price. And Paul is, he's addressing this uh, tension that's between the Corinthian Christians of whether or not they should be able to buy that meat and, and eat it knowing that it was sacrificed to idols. And he, he gives some instructions in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23 or chapter 10. But let me just read this one verse, verse 23. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. It's almost the exact same phrase that Paul used in the earlier chapter that we read for our text. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Again, what he's saying here is, listen, you are certainly free to eat food offered to idols if you want to. It's not against God's law to eat such meat, but that does not mean that you should go ahead and do it. It may be perfectly legal, technically speaking, but it might not be the best and it might not be helpful to the body of Christ or to the church. He says there's some things, sure, you're permitted or you could do, but is it best for the whole church? Is it best for the whole body? Is it going to be something that helps the body of Christ or hurts the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul writes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I know I'm using a lot of scripture, but it is midweek Bible study. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all. Why don't you say that word with me? All. Say all. Do all to the glory of God. Verse 32, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. In another place in scripture, Paul says, I become all things to all men so that by all means, some might be saved. Paul had this mindset, just like he wrote in scripture, and I believe he prayed, and I know I pray, Lord, let that mind which was in Christ Jesus be also in me. He sought the best in any situation. You know, we need to graduate, and I've said this before to my church family, but we need to graduate from the mentality that is always asking, is this wrong or right? Is this good or evil? But we need to graduate and mature in our thinking to the point where we start asking a better question. 
Is this good or is this best? Where we don't, we don't spend so much energy and time trying to decide whether or not we're going to do good or evil, but we start focusing on a more elevated and mature decision and start looking at life and asking ourselves, is this good or best? I've known too many Christians that have tried to live their life asking whether or not they should do something by using this question, will it send me to hell? Will it send me to hell? Listen, that is that is such a low-level, elementary, immature reasoning that we should leave behind us as we grow in Christ. We don't need to ask whether or not something will send us to hell and try to determine whether or not we should participate in it or wear it or do it or say it or watch it. But no, we need to graduate beyond that where we start asking ourselves, listen, if I do this or if I do this, which is better? It's not us trying to discern between good and evil, but between good and best. I am speaking tonight to you about when we can, but we don't. When we can, but we don't. Here's a beautiful word of wisdom that can be helpful for you and all uh, that you influence with your life. That word is discernment. It is synonymous with the word judgment. Judgment. Now, I know that I said uh I said a bad word to some of you, judgment or judge. I know a lot of people misquote and misuse Jesus' teachings on judgment and say things like, you know, the Bible says, judge not. Or maybe you rephrase it and you say, or, you know, Jesus says you shouldn't judge. Or the Bible says you shouldn't judge. Those words have been the demise and the death, the spiritual death of so many that have, I'm sure, been sincere in their faith, but they have misappropriated and misused Jesus' teachings on judgment. These words may sound good, they may even sound right, but the broad brush that many have used to paint their worldview with these not biblical and even practical thoughts or ideas is absolutely and unequivocally unequivocally wrong. Yes, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, but read on. He says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? He goes on to say in verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Listen, judgment is something that God encourages in our life. And first and foremost, we need to learn to judge ourselves. We need to learn to discern what's right and wrong in our lives, what's good and best in our lives. Now, let me say, as I've said before, I've learned long ago that I'm completely unfit to judge the hearts of men. Only God can. But you know what? I could learn how to use discernment in my life. Now, let me give you a Bible story to make this case uh, here for you tonight. David, that's right, David, the one that killed the giant. Many of you know him as that shepherd boy that used the sling and uh, the stone to kill that giant. Well, this is a little while later, we find uh, that David was anointed by the prophet Samuel to become the next king. And he was not yet king, uh, but he was anointed and he was awaiting his day. And uh, through the course of events, we find that King Saul, who was king of Israel, began to despise and be jealous, have this awful hatred for David that he tried to kill him. There was a couple of times where he took a javelin, a spear, and he threw it so hard and tried to pin David to the wall. When David was in his courtroom, he tried to pin David to the wall and narrowly missed him and the javelin stuck into the wall. 
Could you imagine David? He's running for his life and Saul is gathering his strongest men in his army to pursue David and to try to kill him. And there were not one time, but two times that David had the opportunity to kill Saul. Once was in the cave found in the wilderness of En Gedi, the cave of En Gedi in 1 Samuel 24. The second time was in the hill of Hikala in 1 Samuel chapter 26. So once in a cave, the other on a hill. Caves are dark and can be symbolic of hidden and secret places of our lives, while hills are raised and they are visible and they can be symbolic of the public and influential times of our lives. But let Listen, neither, neither place, the cave or the hill, prove proper to a man after God's own heart as an appropriate place to kill a leader whom God anointed, even if the leader was in the wrong and lay vulnerable to attack as in both circumstances. What David did is David exercised self-restraint. When he could have killed Saul, he didn't. When he could have, he didn't. Furthermore, I grew up going to church and there was an immature approach that we would use when we were younger and teenagers. And we would be asked by our classmates in our public schools why we didn't do certain things or why we didn't wear certain things, go certain places or talk certain ways. And I, I would say, as I'm sure many of my peers would say to those who would ask such questions, I would say something like this, I can't because of my religion, or I can't because my pastor said so. Well, listen, we need to graduate from that kind of thinking. It's not about a set of rules found in religion or even a set of demands or expectations that pastor may communicate. The fact of the matter is, this might come as a shock to you, but I'll let you know quite clearly, you can cuss. You can drink, you could smoke, and the list could go on and on. You could do all of those things, but you've got to begin to be able to answer people who ask you such questions in a way like this. I can do those things, but I choose not to. Because I value my relationship with Jesus Christ far too much to allow the things that I know that would hurt my spirit, hurt my future, and hurt my relationship with the Lord. I value that relationship too much to allow myself to do such things. It's self-restraint. It's communicating that I can do those things, but I choose not to. Now tonight, my responsibility is to not only bring to light that there may be things that we can do within our, not even that are necessarily sinful, but not sinful within our Christian liberty that we should not do because it's not profitable or expedient or beneficial to ourselves or to others. But I am also called to challenge the church tonight with a healthy measure a further conviction. God is asking the same question of us tonight that he asked Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 through 9, when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, we find that Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And we find in verse 9 of Genesis 3 that the Lord God called unto Adam and said, that's right, you know what he says next, where are you? And I'm asking that question right now. Church family, where are you? you. So here's that special announcement you've been waiting for. It's happening right now. Um, I've got a little bit of an attendance experiment that I would like to try tonight. I would like you to text the word here to the number on your screen right now. Text the word here, H-E-R-E, text the word here to the number on the screen and also the number of people that you represent. So if you are watching the service alone, just text here and the number one. If you're watching with your spouse or with your children, text the total number of the people in the room that are watching the service. And uh, now I, I know that 
I could get onto our YouTube uh, channel and look at the analytics and find out uh, how many people are watching or how many people have watched and how long they've watched, which that's really interesting because we, we know how long people are watching for, uh, whether it's the whole time or just a portion of the time. So we, we could keep track of whether or not people watch for a little while and then stop watching or skip through uh, preliminaries or songs and just cut to the chase and go to the preaching or whatever. Um, but what we're, we're wanting to develop this culture of accountability even during this season. We want to help produce accountability within our church members because we know that accountability is what brings spiritual growth. When we hold one another accountable, we could we could uh, be more certain that we are growing spiritual, we, uh, more spiritual. We will also keep attendance with Sunday school and youth church, especially moving forward. I've been communicating with Sunday school teachers on how many people were on the Zoom call, whether it's our junior high class, our senior high class, our youth church. I'm always checking on those calls to see how many people are there. And, and the truth is how many people are not there. And so it's all in an effort to cultivate accountability, which equals growth. Now, what is this all about? I won't be much longer, so just bear with me, okay? Everyone say amen. So stick with me. There has been a social media post that has been copied and shared by many throughout the month of April, and you may have seen it, you may have even read it. The heading reads, I pray we don't go back to normal. And then it lists seven things. Number one, I pray that the next time a friend grabs me and pulls me in for a hug, I actually take the time to appreciate the gift of their embrace. Number two, I pray that when school resumes and people are dropping kids off, that they take time to thank the staff of the amazing gift that they give to our community and to our children. Number three, I pray that the next time I'm sitting in a crowded restaurant, I take time to look around at the smiling faces loud voices, and thank God for the gift of community. I pray that the next time I'm standing in church, listening to the voices of praise and worship, that I take a moment to thank God for the gift of congregation. Number five, I pray that the next time I see a person or situation that needs prayer, I hope I pray as passionately and fervently as I have prayed these past few weeks. Number six, I pray that when I'm at the grocery store, that I take a moment to thank God that he provides us with the necessities of life and the amazing people who work so hard to keep us supplied. And number seven, I pray that I never again take for granted the ability to hop in the car and visit a friend, go to the mall, or go to a gathering. So truth is, the post reads on, I don't want things to return to the way they once were. I pray that we take the lessons and challenges of the past few weeks and create a new normal. My goal is to pray more, love harder, and truly appreciate the daily abundance of blessings that were so easily overlooked just a few weeks ago. Be blessed today, the post ends. So this is, uh, this is what I want to say when I can, but I don't. There's a positive side that I've already shared with you in the first portion of this message that we need to exhibit a portion of self-restraint, self-control for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of ourselves, that there's certain things that, sure, we could do them, but we choose not to. But there is also a dark and negative side of this very statement. When we exhibit the lack the lack of self-responsibility that results in the self-inflicted injury of ourselves or others and the church. And again, to prove this case, let me take you to a Bible story. Daniel, that Old Testament prophet, though a captive in Babylon, was promoted by the king to such a degree that it made three princes especially jealous, so much so that they wanted Daniel dead and gone. So they deceived the king, King Darius, to make a decree that was sure to satisfy their thirst for Daniel's blood. And when the decree was made law by King Darius under the counsel of these wicked men, that nobody shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, which is interesting considering our circumstances, that our governor in Illinois is making decrees 30 days at a time, and we are 
yet to see another 30 days of our shelter in place orders through the month of May. And uh, they go on to say that nobody can ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days except unto the king. And if he does so, he'll be cast into the den of lions. You know the story. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And so you know what the word of God says next. In Daniel 6, verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before. Just like he did before. When he was told that he couldn't, he did anyhow. When he was told that he could not pray anymore to his God, he did it anyhow. Daniel had strength to do just this, that we read about centuries later, thousands of years later, we read about Daniel. Why? Because he had strength to do this because when he could do it, he did. When he could pray, when there was no law against praying, when he had the opportunity to pray, he did so. So that when the time came that the law was made against him praying, he did it anyhow because he had strength that he gleaned from the time that he could and he did. I feel such thick conviction right now. To the wonderful people that call me their pastor, please allow me to be the shepherd that God expects me to be right now. To everyone else that's watching or listening to this message, excuse me while I speak from a shepherd's heart to the flock of God. I sense that perhaps some, some are struggling during this time. And while I'm a huge supporter and advocate of us gathering together again in one place for the purpose of worship and hearing the word of God, I'm afraid that there are many of my dear brothers and sisters in Christ that are spiritually struggling right now. And I would ask you the question that God asked of Adam, where are you? Where are you, spiritually speaking, and also uh, literally speaking, where are you? Have you been missing out on these video services? I could pretty much guarantee that there are going to be church members that when we come out of this, they are going to be spiritually stronger than, we, than they were when we went into this. And at the same toll, there are also going to be church members that are spiritually weaker in fact, right now, they are struggling spiritually. And I wonder, is it because when we can, we don't? Is it because that for the same people that struggled with their church attendance when there were no restrictions on public gatherings, it was not a great priority in their life? And so now there are restrictions and now we have to take the time to sit down and to push aside distractions to tune in for a videoed service that we're choosing not to. Listen, you can. You can pray. You can watch these services. Don't make excuses for yourself. Listen, you can grow spiritually healthy and strong. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost wanting to speak to my church family you can and you should. You ought to make up your minds tonight on things that truly matter, whether it's convenient or not. You can and therefore you will. You will take time to pray each day. You will take time to get yourself into the word of God. I want to up the level of accountability among our church family, if this is going to be for the next month and we're going to continue to video our services, I want to do whatever I can to, to increase the level of accountability. Not because I'm trying to be hard on my church family or police my church family, but because I care for each and every one of you and your spiritual health. And I know that God on the other side of this, and even during this time, he has got revival that is waiting for us to realize. He has got souls that he's waiting for us to reach. And we ought not to be spiritually asleep. Let's take time for these services. Let's make it a priority. 
If you wouldn't have missed church before all this, for whatever you're missing these services for now, stop. Stop giving yourself excuses. Let's tune in. Let's take time to pray. Let's take time to connect. And I'm asking parents, grandparents, and all those who are young people and children live with, make sure that you are encouraging our children and our young people to take time for our Sunday school Zoom calls, our Sunday school videos for our kids, our youth church tonight. All of our young people should be joining the call at 8 p.m. tonight. And for some of our kids, our young people, especially our younger kids, this really is on our parents' shoulders to carry this responsibility and to make sure that our children are tuning in for these services especially on Sunday afternoon when we have our Sunday school calls. And I'm asking you to help us. I know the weather's changing. I know that we want to get out of our houses. I know things are warming up. We battle the same thing here at our house. Amen. But let's make sure that we're faithful, that when we can, we do. Amen. God bless you. I love every one of you. Let's continue to march forward in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.